Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming. I know that this is a tough time in the year, um, like literally a few days of classes left, um, and that can be a little bit stressful. But obviously, this is an important conversation, um, and so I'm happy that we can have it. I don't want to spend too much time talking because I would really like to turn this over to our amazing guests today. But I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, this is really important to me, and I think it's really important to a lot of people here at the law school. Um, it's no secret that, that the Me Too movement has really taken on a life of its own um, and is uncovering a lot of really important and frankly disturbing things um, that are underlying our society. Um, and when thinking about this event, so yesterday I was actually having a conversation with Dean Elvin, um, and he was encouraging me to think about what my goals for this program are. Um, and I was alarmingly unprepared to answer that question. Um, and, I, and I gave it some thought, and I think it's because my, my goal here I don't think it's possible to have, with this issue, I don't think that, you know, the, the goal obviously would be let's find a solution and end the problem. But that's, that would be a huge oversimplification for me to say that. So, um, but, so I, what I really think my goal is is just to have a conversation. Um, because I think that on this issue we need to keep having conversations. I think that we have learned um, over the last year, and, and frankly, you know, many of us have known this for a very long time, um, that this issue is deeply pervasive um, and really has invaded every aspect of our lives. Um, and I think it's through conversations that we kind of chip away at the layers of this problem. Um, and we'll keep chipping away until you know, maybe we've actually uncovered something. Um, but for right now, I want this to be another conversation where we can maybe get a few more things out there and give people a chance to ask some questions. I will ask that we hold questions until the end just to make sure that we have some time to get through everything, but then please feel free to ask um, or stick around later. Um, so we are joined today by Allie Colesteel and Ryan Park. Both are Harvard Law grads. It's okay. We still let them come here. Um, and they were both litigation associates at Boy Schiller in DC. Um, Allie, do you want me to call you Allie, Miss Steele? Yeah. Let's go with Allie. All right, we're all friends here. So Allie worked um, for a number of years before law school on political campaigns. Um, she served as a deputy voter protection director in the legal department of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign headquarters in Brooklyn. Um, and Ryan served as a clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You may have heard of her. Um, they have both previously written about workplace gender equality in publications such as the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Jezebel. So without further ado, I would like to welcome them. Thank you. So I think we'll just start by um, introducing ourselves a little bit first. And uh, I want to begin by saying thank you to Julia and um, to the school for bringing us here and, and having this conversation. I really couldn't agree more that there's a lot of value to talking about this issue, and one goal of mine is to empower more people to feel comfortable talking about this issue and, and um, in their own workplaces or among their peers. So I really appreciate your organizing this event. Um, as Julia mentioned, my background really is mostly in politics. I worked for about six years before I went to law school on political campaigns and then um, on Capitol Hill. And I kind of made a deal with myself that if I went to law school, I could always come back to politics if I missed it. And I knew I would be graduating in the spring of 2016 and that there would be a presidential campaign underway. So I observed during my 3L year as the race shaped up and by the spring, it was clear to me that I wanted to get involved um, and not set, sit that one out after having worked in 2008 and, and 2012. And I... Um, reached out to Mark Elias, who is an alum of this law school, and Mark and I had um, met working together in 2012 on Tim Kaine's Senate race in Virginia. Mark was our outside counsel, and um, I was handling our recount preparation, so we'd worked together then, and he was then general counsel on the Clinton campaign, and so he hired me, um, and basically the day after I turned in my last law school paper, I moved to Brooklyn and um, worked as the deputy voter protection director there mostly focusing on um, voting rights. We did some litigation, which actually Ryan 
at Boy Schiller helped with as uh, one of our pro bono counsel. Uh, we we uh, brought litigation to challenge a number of state uh, restrictive voting laws that have been put into place after Shelby County and um, and uh, and we also I mostly focus on our election day operations. So I manage our volunteer lawyer program and um, our operations around the country and especially in our battleground states for November eighth. After the election, I um, did a lot of soul searching. I think I'm still soul searching about uh, about what went wrong there and. Um, and really just decided to, to step back from politics for a bit and went to Boy Schiller where I had been a summer associate during law school and worked there for eight months doing litigation, um, very in intense and trial focused, but learned a lot in a short amount of time. And then in October, um, as the Me Too movement started taking off, I, I was really inspired by that and, and my own and my own kind of per personal capacity started participating in the movement, in the conversations. And then in November, um, it came out in the press that Boy Schiller had been involved in, it had been it already been reported that David had represented Harvey for a number of years and that in of itself didn't really spark a lot of concern or controversy because I think that is what lawyers often do is represent clients who have, are in trouble or have done bad things. Um, but when the news came out in November that the firm had hired Black Cube, which is this investigative firm that had um, targeted and, and lied to and secretly recorded some of the women coming forward about um, what Weinstein had done to them with the goal of having their stories not reported in the press, um, that obviously caused a larger um, conversation at the firm. And as one associate put it, uh, business sort of went down for a little while. Um, but, the, but the plus side of that was it really gave an opportunity to have a lot of discussions. I mean, we did almost nothing but talk about this issue and sexual harassment and Me Too and what is the role of lawyers and what was the firm's responsibility to put themselves on the right side of this issue in light of what, what had come out about Black Cube. And after doing that, I, I just realized that this was something I, I really enjoyed engaging on. I felt um, like I had learned a lot about where people were on this issue. And, and the biggest takeaway for me was that um, this issue is one that I think can really bring people together and that, um, that once is explained, explained the right way to, to people, I think there's a lot of understanding and interest in, in change, but that there's a lot of education that needs to happen uh, around this issue and that there's a big generational divide on that as well. And so I wanted to continue doing this work um, and, and was sort of had my momentum going in terms of, of uh, engaging on the issue. And so I went back to, uh, to Mark, who a little bit with my tail between my legs because he had tried to convince me to go do something else after the election. And I turned him down and said, no, I want to go to Boy Schiller and came back to him in December and said, um, you know, that I I was interested in continuing to work on this, and especially from a political angle, there, was, there wasn't really an issue-based advocacy group um, doing the typical work that, for example, Planned Parenthood or NARAL do on choice or every town does on gun safety, and um, asked him you know, whether he saw a need for this, and if so, if that I thought I might be interested in, in starting something, and, and he agreed that there was a need and said he would help me do it and encouraged us to move quickly. So. We did, and we launched um, in January, at the end of January, so we're just about two and a half months old now at the Purple Campaign, um, and we are uh, really focused on bringing policy change, which is part of why I'm so excited to be talking to you guys, because I think lawyers have a very unique role to play on that effort. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about why, why policy change is sort of our focus, but we're working with lawmakers and with employers on um, basically ensuring that the awareness that's been raised out of the Me Too movement and the stories that have been shared um, by millions of women turns into long-term change that's positive for women. And I think I started to see some um, knee-jerk reactions to, which were well-intentioned to create change, but that ultimately, you know, I, I have concerns about in, in terms of the long-term effect for women in the workplace. So that's what we're doing at the Purple Campaign. And um, when Julia asked me to come speak, we were brainstorming ways to bring in a diverse group of people and especially men into the conversation. And I, um, I reached out to Ryan and I will let him talk a little bit about, about himself and why he's here. Sure, yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Julia. And, and thanks to Allie for inviting me here as well to join uh, in this conversation. I, you know, I, so I guess 
when uh, people, <laughs> when I've told people I'm doing this conversation, they ask me, why are you doing that conversation? Uh, and so I think maybe just briefly talk about uh, why I'm here. So, I mean, yeah, Ali's a friend of mine, and I, when she started this group, I, I asked uh, her how I could help, um, and this is, this is one way. I think, um, you know, so I considered myself uh, an advocate on gender equality. I, um, I helped with a paid leave campaign in, in D.C. that was, um, has been successful so far. Uh, and I, I represented a, a CNN reporter uh, for, and, and we got a very, very good settlement, which involved a change in uh, Time Warner's policies um, to have equal parental leave, um, uh, you know, with accommodations for uh, medical recovery and everything. And so I, I considered myself, you know, a gender equality advocate. And uh, when Me Too happened, uh, it totally blew me away, and I was totally shocked and surprised. And I, I think uh, the, and in conversations with people like Ali, I realized that, you know, these conversations were happening uh, without me, and that even uh, people that I considered close personal friends and I think considered me an ally uh, didn't feel comfortable uh, telling me about some of the experiences that they had had, uh, including in professional environments that I had been in. And so, um, you know, we had, you know, we had initial call uh, to talk about this, and I was very quiet at the beginning, and uh, I think Ali told me I have to talk more, and I think, uh, I th and then I think, you know, that's important because, uh, you know, this, just like uh, the issues that I had been focusing on before in terms of um, equal leave policies and uh, gender discrimination in the workplace generally, uh, you know, this can't be just a woman's issue. It's great that there are a lot of guys here because it marginalizes the conversation, uh, and it really exposes people uh, to having uh, this discussion in a uh, victim perpetrator type um, mentality as opposed to this is a civil rights problem is a social problem um, that everyone should be engaged in. Yeah, and I just add quickly to that. I think one of the things that was so inspiring to me about what happened at the firm was seeing my male colleagues, both associates and some of the younger male partners, a lot of whom had a ton of power within the firm, using their voices almost more loudly than I felt com comfortable using mine. And I think it is such an important piece of this because there are things that, you know, I think, I think as women in the workplace, like, we have to be careful about how we talk about these issues sometimes. And I think men have a little bit more leeway to, um, and, 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 and power because firms want to make sure all their employees and all employers want to make sure that everybody is happy in the workplace. And if they know this is a problem that men care about as well, they're going to take it more seriously. And so that's been one of the things I think is different about this moment is that there are men at the table. And, and I'm so glad that you're here. So I'm, I'm going to sort of moderate, although I don't actually think that these two really need a moderator, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I do want to say, I don't think I realized quite how new the campaign was when I contacted you, which is no wonder that like I was able to get you here next year. You'll probably be not available to do this. So I'm very happy that you're here now. <clears throat> so I think, you know, before we can really get into sort of the practical side of things and what and what we in the room can do, um, it's important to have a little bit of context. And on, on some level, I think we all know what the Me Too movement is about. But um, it's still, given your somewhat unique perspectives, I'd like to just pose the question to you. I mean, how do you see the Me Too movement? What is, what is it about? And, um, and, and what is it exposing? What are we learning here? I mean, I think for me, especially as a lawyer and somebody who'd studied uh, sexual assault on the campus context and in general in criminal law and otherwise, and who'd been reading a lot about gender discrimination more broadly throughout my career, what this moment to me is about is realizing that we thought as lawyers and as employers and as society that we solved this problem uh, in the 1970s when women started entering the workforce in large numbers, and that's when, um, in 1964, we passed Title VII, and the law evolved in the courts since then in a way that we created the EEOC and, and all of these channels and official ways of handling sexual harassment. And I think what Me Too has revealed is that that system has failed and it's broken, and there needs to be a really holistic reassessment of why that is and what can be done. And I think there are legal reasons and policy-based reasons why it's failed, but there are also deep cultural issues that I think the movement and the stories that have been shared have exposed. And that's part of why you know, I think the moment is ripe to turn towards solutions and, and, and trying to figure out how we right that wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, I think similarly, or I guess I would just focus on 
you know, the legal aspect of it. I mean, I think what has been very revealing is to the extent to which legal tools have been used to um, perpetuate the silence. And, you know, uh, we don't have to uh, go in great detail, but I mean, there's the post harassment kind of uh, hush uh, agreements. And, and there are also, you know, the kind of pre harassment um, arbitration agreements, non disclosure agreements. And, uh, and these are not, you know, ans the legal ancillary aspects of the problem. They're really core to the problem. They're why we didn't know about it. Um, or, you know, to the extent uh, that we do now. Uh, and, you know, in story after story, uh, it's, uh, people had been uh, silenced through the law, and I think that's something that we, as lawyers, have to, to focus on, uh, that, that the legal aspects of this issue are core. Uh, and, yeah. yeah, and they perpetuate the cultural ones, because I think the legal, the, pol the official policies that are in place set the tone for, you know, for the broader cultural aspects. So given that, you know, how, do you, how do you see the Me Too movement as, like, what impact do you feel like it's had on the legal profession so far? I mean, obviously it's there. I mean, we're all impacted by this, but, but the legal profession in particular. Yeah, so I think there's a couple, you know, a couple big headlines that we've seen come out um, in the press over the last couple of months. I think probably the first reckoning of the legal profession with this was the Boy Schiller Weinstein news. Um, and that really, to me, raises the question of, what is the role of lawyers here, and where do lawyers cross the line in terms of complicity? Um, and I think we've seen this asked about others. For example, in the um, USA Gymnastics context, there have been consequences for administrators at the school who knew and helped um, enable. And I think that question applies to the role of lawyers as well, and that's very much what a lot of our conversations that um, boys were focused on because in that context, you're not talking about a harasser. You are talking about somebody who has represented a harasser, and that is different. And as lawyers, we need to understand and, and tackle, I think, that distinction. Um, and then there's also been uh, Me Too in the workplace, in the legal profession. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what's been happening in the law firm context and then turn it over to Ryan to talk about clerkships and, and the judiciary. Um, but I think this, the law firm piece is, is more recent, and some of you may have been following over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of movement on this. Um, there was a, a, a leaked agreement that Munger Tolls was using for their summer associates, um, I think it was their summers, to, that was a, a four secret arbitration agreement. Um, and I was saying earlier, I, I'm not sure whether it was a new agreement that was their response to me to, or whether this was something that they had had in place all along, but it got leaked on Twitter by a Harvard Law School um, uh, lecturer and sparked a lot of outrage. And Munger, within 48 hours over a weekend, issued a statement rescinding the policy. After that, Oric did the same voluntarily, and um, Skadden did a couple days later. And now I think it remains to be seen what, whether other firms will follow. Um, a lot of law students have been organizing letters to NALP or to um, the school about recruitment by firms who have these policies in place. So I think we're really just getting started in terms of seeing what happens on the law firm front. But um, it's certainly an issue in, the, in that industry as it is now we know everywhere. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about sure. the clerkship context? Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, I assume that people have heard of uh, Judge Kaczynski and uh, the scandal that uh, he found himself in. I think, uh, you know, the... I still believe that this is, uh, in um, uh, most professional environments, uh, uh, well, at least in, in that professional environment, it, it's, it's, it's pretty rare, um, but that um, it's the type of situation where one perpetrator can uh, harm many, many people. And so, um, and, and I think that it's pronounced in, uh, in the clerkship context because there are these formal walls of secrecy uh, and, uh, and loyalty. Uh, and, uh, and so I think, I, I, I think that it's probably rare, but there are probably others out there and we just don't know. Um, I, I have spoken to people who have reached out to me uh, about, um, about judges uh, that they have clerked for. And so I think, you know, if we want to move into uh, about, you know, things that are actually more disturbing than uh, Judge Kaczynski, um, I think that uh, in terms of... Uh, Move, I, we'll, we'll have like a practical uh, discussion, but, um, you know, again, I think this conversation is just starting. I think that the federal judiciary is doing a lot uh, 
to try to move in that direction, but, but I don't think enough. Um, but, you know, they've established a working group and they've pledged to publish statistics on reports, uh, uh, sexual harassment reports that have been made. Uh, and, you know, I think more affirmative measures are needed, but it, the conversation has started and I think that's a good thing. And just in getting ready for this event, um, doing a little bit of my own research, it seems, um, I think th things seem to be moving pretty quickly um, and you're seeing companies jump on board as well. I saw that, I think it was Microsoft that took some big steps to get rid of all these agreements for their employees. And so I think it's, it's given how early it is, it's inspiring how quickly these things are moving. Um, and it's also been pretty, pretty cool um, from, from my side of the table to see um, how engaged the law schools are with this question as well. So um, it's definitely something that everyone's aware of um, and you know, really working to make progress on. Um, so you know, I think we've kind of talked about like the reforms that you see are needed. I mean, do you see anything else in that space in terms of like, you know, what, what you would like to see, what we should be moving towards? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking as Ryan was talking about the judiciary <laughs> that one thing I've observed in my work so far on this issue is that the problem of sexual harassment is inevitably worse in environments where the power dynamic at play is worse. And we see it in politics. There's um, a huge culture on the Hill and on campaigns around members who are sort of the rock stars and everybody serves them and wants to work for them. I think that dynamic is similar in clerkships with judges and where there's a real fear of, um, of rocking the boat. And I think that in the legal profession, that's a very uh, pronounced dynamic everywhere. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, nervousness about about speaking up. And so on the on the reform front, you know, the, the big things that are happening right now, which need to be addressed first, in my view, are um, ending the practice of forced arbitration of these claims and um, ending the use of confidentiality around reporting. But I think that there is a real consensus growing and we're essentially there on that issue. I don't think everyone's changed their policies yet and I think the pressure needs to be kept up. But we've seen Microsoft, Airbnb, now three major law firms agree that it is time to end those practices. And I think once you're there, um, you know, I can see a path toward the rest following. And, and I want to let Ryan talk a little bit about the bill that's been introduced in the House and the Senate. It's a bipartisan bill that was led by a number of attorney generals. Um, so I think those two things are, are important and I think likely to happen. I think the deeper reforms that are essential, though, really have to get at the, the cultural problem that creates a fear around reporting in the first place. We know that about 70% of people who experience harassment don't report it in the first place to a manager or supervisor. And from my experience, anecdotally, and my friends, that, that's very true. I think most people aren't reporting. And the, the reason for that is there's very little incentive to report. Because what we know is that um, oftentimes, at best, reports are met with indifference by the employer, um, where they're the perpetrator is allowed to continue um, in their role with little consequence. And often uh, worse, there is a consequence to the reporter and they, they suffer professional consequences as a result, whether that's retaliation in the form of sort of informal uh, blacklisting or even something as subtle as just getting reassigned to a new partner where you get less good work. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting about the judiciary is that they, as a part of this working group, the Senate um, Grassley and Feinstein, the chairs of the Judiciary Committee, asked uh, the judiciary to report on some statistics, as Ryan mentioned, and they reported that there were zero reports of harassment in 2016. Well, I believe that's true. I don't believe that means there's no harassment happening. And so I think that getting at that is, is harder and more complicated, but I think it involves things like setting up third-party reporting structures. A lot of companies like Airbnb have a hotline that is run by you know, a third party where they can report to or, or options for people to report through a number of different channels. It also requires employers to start sending a top-down message that retaliation is, is, that people are going to be protected from retaliation or better that they're encouraged to report and that's going to be seen as a positive and good thing by their employers and an act of courage and, and something that will be taken seriously when they do. Um, and so those are really the things I'm very focused on and, and I think there, there are a lot of um, innovative ideas out there that we'll talk a little bit more about later. Yeah, I mean, so I'll just briefly touch on the legislative 
um, action. So, I mean, Washington State has passed uh, a bill uh, banning um, both uh, mandatory arbitration of sexual harassment claims and non-disclosure agreements in that context. Um, I mean, there's a policy debate around that, but that is happening. There are pending bills in several states, including California and New York, um, and there is a federal bill um, that is bipartisan. Lindsey Graham uh, is a Republican, uh, as well as a Bush Shiller alum, uh, Yellowbrand. Uh, I think she was the main sponsor. Um, that would do the same thing, uh, uh, ban uh, mandatory um, uh, arbitration um, and non-disclosure agreements in, uh, in all, for all sexual harassment claims. So there's real action there. Uh, and so I think, uh, oh, and then, yeah, that there is a, the first time in 10 years, uh, my boss led this coalition, Josh Stein, um, uh, where all 56 attorney, attorneys general, including the territories, signed a letter of support in favor of this legislation. So uh, I think that, you know, we'll get there. Um, and uh, I think that the broader questions are kind of the more affirmative measures um, uh, that, that, and there's, there's no shortage of proposals for more affirmative measures. I mean, I think anyone in this room could strengthen Title VII, uh, you know, in an hour if they had the pen and the power to do so. Um, I think the, the, the issue is, is, you know, how to, how to actually get there. Um, and I think that's why the work Allie's doing. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about um, the financial crisis and some of the lessons that might be learned from yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So uh, Allie and I are talking about this idea. Uh, so, uh, and this has, is rooted in a bill that Elizabeth Warren uh, has, um, has sponsored. And uh, she, I, our understanding, I think, from public reports is there will be bipartisan support for this. But, um, you know, I, I think taking the me, ta taking me to as like a corporate, a Wall Street type scandal, um, and, and what do we do? What, is, what has Congress done uh, when, um, you know, the, the, after the financial crisis, after the accounting crisis with Enron is, I mean, the first thing they do is they impose very stringent uh, transparency requirements on companies that have had these problems, uh, thinking that, you know, like the whole Justice Brandeis quote that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And so, uh, the, this bill, and there are ideas to expand this bill, um, would uh, force employers uh, to uh, be transparent about reports, to uh, you know have have ways uh, to kind of mandate transparency within institutions, uh, and so people know what's happening. Um, and so it's kind of the other side of the banning silence, as, and uh, as well as encouraging transparency. And, and there are uh, companies that are doing this. Um, themselves as well, but I think there will be legislative action. Thank you. So I think the burning question now is, you know, most of the people in this room, I think, are law students. Um, so, you know, how does this affect the students in the room? Me too, and everything that you're talking about. No big deal. It's not <laughs> okay. light softball we'll question. One, uh, one, one question, <laughs> uh, the hardest one. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think when you enter the workplace, looking back on when I entered the workplace after school, um, I think it's important to understand how big of a transition this is. Uh, I think especially if you go into a law firm uh, or a bank or uh, that type of um, institution, it's similar in scope to going to college, honestly, in terms of uh, the cultural change and the power dynamics and how uh, everything that you came to know is now different in this new environment. It's not a continuation of law school. And, uh, you know, the, so I think it's, it's incredibly exciting. It's, it's a reason to be excited. Going to college is great. Um, but there are, you know, lurking dangers there that now people are conscious enough to know that those exist and they take action to prepare for it. Um, so I guess just very broadly, I would encourage people uh, to view the transition in that lens. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible, exciting time, um, but there is this, uh, there are mind, there, it's, there are, yeah, minds in that field or whatever the, the wrong metaphor is. And uh, to approach it with a sense of, of, of studied caution. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, you are in a unique position to create, um, to create change on this issue. And I think it's, you know, you're likely to be impacted by Me Too, I think, in a couple, couple of ways. One is, you know, obviously we hope that this doesn't happen, but we now know sexual harassment is a systemic problem in every workplace, and it's something that everybody should go into any job eyes wide open about as a, a thing that happens. And I think that 
Um, one really practical thing that you can do is to um, just ask about what you should do if that happens to you. I mean, you also have the tools to know um, under the law, you know, what, the, what your rights are and what the formal process is, but every workplace has different um, policies about it. And I think understanding those, and I know we're going to get to practical advice in a minute, so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I think you know, you, you are entering the profession and you are being recruited into it. You are desirable employees and candidates. And so I think that you also have a voice and an understanding of these issues and an authority on them, frankly, as lawyers. Um, this is another thing that struck me since launching the Purple Campaign is how often I'll talk to really even high level business executives who are not lawyers and they feel ill-equipped to speak on this issue or they feel like they are, they need more information or, or are nervous about doing it. And I think that it's not actually as big of a black box as people think it is, but because it veers into the legal realm, um, there is a lot of work to be done by people who understand that realm to shed some light on how this issue works and, and what the dynamics are, what the problems are, and what some of the solutions are. So should we get to the practical yeah. stuff? Yeah. I feel like that's, yeah, I mean, we've been circling that for a while. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's all of this is very big, right? Um, and it's happening on a, a global scale. So Duke Law students sitting here in the room, what, what role can the students play? Yeah, so I'll talk about a couple of things, and then um, I want Ryan to talk a little bit about what men, what men can do specifically and um, sort of the, the bystander role that I think is really important here. Um, but, you know, first of all, I think if you experience harassment in the workplace, um, you're all probably entering into new workplaces, whether it's for a summer job or um, a long-term post-law school position. And I have been really surprised by the extent to which the legal profession is actually behind the curve in a lot of places. This is a generalization, but in terms of onboarding new employees and explaining policies and training people on sexual harassment. I mean, I had come from, um, you know, on the Hill and otherwise I always had to sit through those, you know, hour long trainings, which in my opinion are not that effective, but was at least a thing that people did. And when I started at my firm, there was no sexual harassment training at all. There was no explanation to me about who I would report something to or what the process is like. And so I think when you come into your workplaces, you will have an opportunity for onboarding. I was given an opportunity to ask questions. I couldn't really think of any, but this is one that I think everyone should be asking. And it's an incredibly helpful if you do. And you can just do it in a factual way. And it's like, the right time to do that, which is just, what is the policy around this? If, if, I, if I were to experience something, how do I report it? And it'll cause, I think, um, employers to think more carefully about that and to be better about being transparent about their policies in the onboarding process. And then I think as lawyers, you can also assess those policies for yourselves and decide whether you think they're adequate or problematic in some way. And I was really encouraged to see that happen um, with whichever associate saw the Munger agreement and thought, this is no, this is not acceptable to me. And she spoke out about that. And you know, I think doing that whatever way is comfortable to you is important and whether that's you even that that can just be to your to the hr manager or to the partner who recruited you where you are which is to say you know i looked at this policy and i don't think it it it's enough because xyz and so i think that you have um, a unique voice to do that and that's something that will really help affect a lot of change um, and it'll also give you the information about what you should do if you were to experience anything in your workplace. Um, there are also a couple of groups, you know, we're not as focused on uh, victim support at the Purple Campaign because there are a lot of great groups out there that are doing that work. Um, Rain and Better Brave are two I would mention just if, if you ever do need a resource or need to refer a friend um, for counseling or um, reporting, Rain has a hotline that you can call um, and Better Brave is a newer organization that's just getting started to help provide support to people in the workplace. So those are two, two tools that you should be aware of um, as well. And I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Ryan now and maybe I'll think sure. of some other things while you're talking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I would say, I mean, this is good advice generally, uh, is to uh, seek allies and realize how big your community is uh, and um, 
it's really, uh, I don't want to say seek a mentor because that's a, um, like a fraught, <laughs> a fraught like professional development issue. But I think, you know, realize that, uh, you know, going through um, succeeding in this environment uh, without, and I'm, I'm thinking law firm, assuming that most people are going to go to law firm, at least at the beginning, uh, it really requires uh, friends and allies and mentors. It really does, no matter who you are. Um, and uh, I think, I think you sh people should be making uh, mature uh, professional decisions about you know, where to work and why um, in, in terms of what the policies are, you know, who is le in the leadership in this firm, uh, and is this a place where people uh, like me succeed or people that you know, uh, I can see myself succeeding in it? And if the question is it's not clear, then ask why. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of, I mean, I'm no expert on, on what to do if you've been harassed, I think, but you have a lot of, you have access to a lot of people who are, uh, a lot of people who can be great resources, and that includes friends and colleagues, it includes people at Duke. Um, I know, like, Ann uh, Gordon, who uh, is uh, director of externships here, that uh, she's a resource, and there are, uh, there are many people that you can go to, and I think uh, the first step is, is to not be silent, um, because, uh, I think that is um, the core of the problem. Yeah, and I think, you know, for men, what that means, too, is that if you, and this is something that um, we hosted an event last, or two weeks ago, with the general counsel of Airbnb, Rob Chestnut, who is really leading on this issue, and we have a link to the video on our website, but I would encourage everyone to watch it. Um, but one of the things he talks a lot about is, you know, as a, as a man, if, if that's, you're in a meeting and you hear a remark that's made that maybe doesn't rise to the level of sexual harassment under the law, but is nonetheless inappropriate or, you know, discriminatory in some way, pulling that person aside afterward in, a, in an informal setting to say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't think you should have said that, and here's why. Um, and then also reaching out to the to the person who was on the other end of the comment or whatever it was, and asking, you know, hey, are you doing okay? Are you all right? Um, that didn't seem right to me. That has so much uh, power, I think, especially for people to know they're not alone in observing um, that something was off about an interaction. Um, and I think that to Ryan's point about the transition. You know, law firms and, and any job in the legal profession, they're often all consuming in terms of your workload and it's going to be busy. And I think that one thing that often happens as a result of that is that people tend to isolate themselves a little bit in their work. And I think that being there as a person who is accessible and not too busy for someone to drop by their office and just chat is, is really important. I, I've seen that the people who have kept silent for the longest about things that have happened to them are people who don't know who to talk to. And I, 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 as I've launched this campaign and become more vocal on this issue, people have started talking to me who never did before, who I knew but not that well. And I think that you know, presenting yourself in whatever way that is, however the opportunity is, as, as somebody who is there to listen and, and there to help is, is really important as well. Yeah, I think just, I mean, I think reaching out is, is really important. I think I've had a similar experience where um, I have, you know, uh, saying I'm doing this event or um, just having general conversations. Um, you know, you reach out to someone about, about an incident that you thought was borderline or generally and really shocked at the response, right? <laughs> and uh, I think there is a lot uh, that is there uh, that, is, that stays uh, beneath the surface. And I think, you know, as a man or as a, a, a woman or as, a, you know, as a, a Duke Law student who has uh, some power in these institutions just by virtue of them really wanting you to be at their firm or their institution, um, just starting a conversation is probably the best practical advice I can give. And, I, I, you know, it's really a fraught process to think about, um, you know, what you would actually <coughs> do uh, in some explosive way. Um, but uh, I think what you should have, I think, at, in terms of your mentality going into these environments is just to be open and to make yourself available to your colleagues. Yeah, and um, two other quick things that popped in my head. One is that... I think um, to Ryan's point about transparency earlier, 
talking more with um, as many people as you feel comfortable about things you're aware of or things you think should be changed also is really important. Ryan and I were talking about uh, Judge Kaczynski and some of the other sort of open secret people in across professions who have now, you know, been outed as known repeat offender harassers. And we were both unaware of the, of this open secret about Judge Kaczynski. And I, you know, and I later learned from very good friends of mine, like my, some of my best friends from law school that they had been told by professors or others um, that they shouldn't apply. And Ryan was saying that he like eagerly applied to those chambers, but if he had known that, he might not have done that. And I think that this, the, the, the lack of transparency around it has a really detrimental effect that I don't think is talked about enough in that essentially the message sent from my friend who's warned by the professor is, okay, I shouldn't go for this job opportunity. But meanwhile, Ryan is eagerly applying and would have potentially accepted and gone on to a Supreme Court feeder judge. And I think that it has like a longer term impact on gender disparity in the profession when that is how these decisions are being made. Um, and so I think just more sharing of that information like to male allies or um, to your friends when people are really um, praising somebody who you maybe know shouldn't have been. I mean, Al, actually Al Franken is a good example for me. I would heard about, I have friends who um, were really pretty egregiously harassed by him, ten, you know, and I've known about that for 10 years. And as he was elected to the Senate and people, and he published his book last year, people would say like, oh, I'm obsessed with Al Franken. And I would always just say, you know, I think he's great and he's done some great policy work. I also have, you know, heard some not so great things about him. And I think that just, you know, not, not to spread false rumors, but to try to, as we move forward with hopefully longer term policy change that actually roots out this problem in a systemic way. Um, in the meantime, I think, I think talking more helps and can only do more good to bring to light problems that need to be addressed. Yeah, so just briefly on, on Kaczynski. So, I mean, I talked, uh, you know, I, I was so excited when I got the interview, right? And I talked to uh, women uh, who, uh, who said, who told me how to do the, how to perform well in the interview, uh, who had interned for him or clerked for him. And then after this came out, I texting with them, I was like, what? <laughs> like, uh, did you know about this? And they were all like, yes, of course. Um, but, you know, and the, the response is, it's not relevant to you because you're a man. Um, and I think it is really the assumption that uh, it's a victim perpetrator issue. And so if you're not a victim, that's not an issue. But I think if you see it uh, as, uh, as a civil rights issue, it is something that everyone should and, and most people do care about. Um, and, you know, I think in a law firm as well, like, and, well and just on him too, uh, really briefly, I mean, Part of his downfall was when his clerks quit. <laughs> you know, like you, it, it, it's really hard to be a judge if you don't have clerks. Uh, and three of his four clerks quit. Uh, and it would have been very difficult for him to do his job. And it would have been this highly embarrassing thing for him to try to recruit uh, new clerks in that situation. Uh, I think there were obviously other pressures. There was this um, commission that was going to investigate him. Um, and the same is true in a law firm environment. You know, no partner is anything without a team of associates to do all the work. Uh, and uh, it's a similar dynamic where they have the power, but uh, they depend uh, exclusively uh, on people that work for them to be loyal and to like them and to want to work with them. And so uh, these types of conversations uh, matter no matter where you work. Yeah, and I'll just end on one note on that, which is that, you know, I do think that to that point, you all and any junior person in any profession have so much more power than you think you do because it feels like you're just getting started and you have to prove yourself and you do. And I think, you know, the better you are at your job, the more effective your voice will be and the more people will rely on you and the more power you have. But Ryan's exactly right. Nobody in power can do their job without the people who support them. And when those people start making their voices heard, I mean, we've seen it, um, you know, with these high school students on the gun issue, and it, 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 your voices matter, and they really do. I think we've seen it with Munger. Like, I think the reason Munger reacted so quickly to that was they care what the law students think, and the Harvard Women's Law Association was, you know, tweeting at dean of students asking at Harvard asking, you know, 
what do you think about this? And, and I think that when, when they realize that the people who they really do need to invest in for the future of the profession care, it's, it's, it's handled um, with a little bit more attention. So I'm totally not the speaker here, but I will say just a couple of things that came to my mind. Um, one is just, we've said this before, I'll say it again, you know, the law school is here for you too. So we have our own policies in place if anything happens during recruiting or your summer jobs. So please tell us, um, we, you know, we want to help and we are here. Um, and the other thing that I think I'm taking from this, both from the program and from talking to these two beforehand and my own thoughts is, I'm pretty optimistic because I feel like this change is already like it's it's like the snowball effect, right? And like and like every single day we're seeing new things. And so for me, having a very negative experience during my one L summer at a firm where it was I don't I won't go into it, but it was it was not a great experience. And back even then I, I did report it. And um there was no like Me Too movement happening at that time. Like it just sort of, you know, I, the rest of the summer was fine and I was fine, but um but, but that's very different now. And so I think that that's, um, that's very inspiring for me. Um, I have one more question, but I, I don't want to run out of time for people who may have to leave. Does anyone have any questions for our guests? Yeah, over here. Let me just, can I just repeat the question for the purposes yeah. of the recording? Um, I probably can't repeat it verbatim, but it was basically about political campaigns and the fact that there is this certain environment on a political campaign and a successful campaign um, with all of its, you know, collegiality can also breed problems like this. Yeah, it's a great question and something I have thought a lot about. And I actually think one really interesting, we were just talking about this before the event, is um, there's a really interesting parallel with Silicon Valley here. And I think that the issues that are coming to light with companies like Uber are very, they're happening for very similar reasons that this is a problem on campaigns. And a lot, my co-founder um, is based in San Francisco and comes from the Silicon Valley tech world. And we ended up deciding to do this together, partly because I, I do think employers are such a critical part of the issue. And she had a very interesting perspective on this from being in that world. And I completely agree that there is a lot of good about informal workplace cultures and it fosters creativity. I think both campaigns and startups, you're, you hit the ground running, you are working crazy long hours that you really are only interested in enjoying working if you like the people you work with. And you know, if I had worked on campaigns and um, one, one thing I saw a company do, Comcast actually, uh, I think, canceled their holiday party after Me Too and had a lunch in the conference room with no alcohol instead. And those kinds of changes, I think to me, like I understand the in instinct and I think it comes from a good place. But if I couldn't go out and have a happy hour drink with my coworkers on campaigns, I would never have done another one. It's the only way you can survive that kind of, you know, working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, because you love the people you do it with. And it does create a team, teamwork mentality and creativity. And so I'm really interested in that balance. And I think companies like Airbnb are doing a really good job of trying to figure that out. Um, for example, and it applies to things outside of just your formal sexual harassment policies, and these are some of the longer term changes we're working on too. Like, for example, what, what is a good inter-office dating policy? I mean, I met my husband on a campaign, and that was not inappropriate. Um, we ultimately ended up leaving the campaign because our relationship was serious enough that like, we just didn't want to keep working together. But there needs to be good policies. People know whether they can date each other. And at Airbnb, they have, and at Facebook too, I think they have a, you can ask someone out one time rule. <laughs> <laughs> and if the person says no, you know, and, and they actually say this in their training, like for the person being asked out, and, you know, if you're like, well, I'm busy, they, they'll tell them if you're really busy, but you're actually interested next time you have to ask out. So if you really want to go for a drink next time, the burden is on you. And like, that seems like a 
reasonable way to me to make sure that you know you're not you're, you're not killing all fun and and yeah. consensual non-problematic relationships but you're also creating an environment where actually the airbnb general counsel said himself like we can't have a situation where people are hiding in the bathroom or avoiding meetings because they're afraid of being asked out again and again by the same person that happens and that happens on campaigns and that should stop so it's complicated but i think we have to figure out that balance because it is the future of like dynamic creative companies and innovation to make sure that you're you're not killing that while you're also making sure your workplace is non-discriminatory. I think there's a there is definitely a path toward that and it shouldn't it shouldn't be um, an either or choice, I think. I'll try to say this in like one minute. Okay, yeah, so because right. there's one big point I wanted to, to to make that I didn't get to in the in the presentation. So I mean, there is a real danger here, right? And it's like the Mike Pence effect. I don't know if you've heard that, but he won't have dinner alone with a woman. And, and there's a big danger that if this becomes an adversarial conversation, uh, that it will, you know, redound to the, to the harm uh, of women primarily. And so uh, I think it is important for it to be uh, cooperative and people uh, to not enter these workplaces scared. You know, I mean, you don't go to, you don't not go to any college parties because there are dangers there, right? You, you still go on the work trips and you still go out on, on drinks with your colleagues and uh, you don't, you're not afraid, you're not living in fear uh, and you're not over you know, analyzing a benign conduct. And so I think it's a really hard balance where um, you, know, you want to succeed in your careers and you, but you want to be appropriately you know, cautious. Was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a part of why, in my mind, I think there's, campuses have two issues, that campuses are a workplace and they're also a university. So they're governed by Title IX in, you know, a lot of this area. And there are so many groups that really are focused on the campus aspect of it, that it's not something that the Purple Campaign is as focused on in that context. But I think your point is critical about the fact that there's still an environment here where there are those same dynamics that exist in, in workplaces, but they're different and they need to be addressed appropriately. So I think this, the same advice I would give would be to ask questions and question policies that to the extent there are some that you think create you know, a culture where people can't speak about things that they should feel in, you know, empowered to speak about. That's one thing that we've seen um, in the judiciary. There were hundreds of former and current clerks who signed a letter um, detailing the problems with that. On, I, I don't know if it's an honor code or an ethical code, but saying, you know, this provision that says you can't speak about anything that happens in chambers or whatever it is, gives an impression that that applies to experiences of harassment and, and we think you need to clarify that. And so I think those same kind of advocacy efforts to the extent that there are, you know, policies or, or, or other issues in place in the law school, whether it's in the law school, whether it's in a workplace, a future workplace, um, are really important and can have a, a similar effect. Yeah. <clears throat> And like I said, the Career Center also has uh, policies in place, so not just for on the job, but if anything happens at any sort of recruiting event on campus, um, we have clear policies for that as well. Yeah.
Yeah, it's tough. I mean, one thing I was saying to Julia before the event is that the practical advice part of this is hard because the policies are so broken that, you know, it's it's difficult in the absence of reform for me to give a, like a great option, which is why I think we need the policy reform. One of the things we're hoping to do and planning, um, we're actually working with uh, Harvard Law School and a couple of GCs on is to do like a corporate certification program that would essentially be kind of like a fair trade labeling for a company to say, not that this company has no instances of harassment, but that they have put in place the kinds of policy reforms that we feel would appropriately root out systemic problems and open secret people. And I think that's a goal of mine because I don't have a great answer to that right now. I think it is all word of mouth and I think that's really problematic. I think just asking as many questions as you can, I would think about asking questions to women who are, you know, recruiting you about the culture of the firm. I wouldn't necessarily ask about harassment specifically because I think, I mean, you, you, you should ask about that too, but I think to get at your point, which is to avoid a defensive reaction or um, is just to ask about the culture. Is this what's the culture of the workplace like? Actually, that's a question I think I asked at EIP anyway. And you actually learn a lot from that about hours and dyna other dynamics. But I think you know, asking as many people as you can about that might help illuminate it. And then I would also ask your peers. You know, people, if to the extent you can get connected with somebody who's somewhere there before or worked there as a more junior associate. I think if you can ask both junior and senior people, you'll, that's the best bet at sort of getting a good picture, a picture of that. So we're definitely running late at this point. I know I've seen several other hands. I'd be happy to take one more question now. And then if we want to keep this conversation going later, yeah, over here. Yeah, I mean, I think um, for the Purple Campaign, a part of what prompted me to do this was ever, watching everything go down in December of uh, 2017 is a good like case study of, I think, what you're talking about, where on the one hand, you had allegations, and I'm mostly talking about politics now, but you had allegations coming out about Franken and Conyers, and you had Nancy Pelosi defending John Conyers at first on TV, at the same time that Roy Moore is running for the Senate, endorsed by Trump, endorsed by other Republicans who then back out of those endorsements, um, and then Doug Jones is elected to the Senate, right? So it was sort of, every, people, it was unclear what direction this was moving in, but what, what the Alabama election showed me was, and my experience at my law firm too, was that with the right uh, framing and the right conversations happening, there is a huge, there is a broader coalition of people who want to do the right thing on this issue and, um, and have the ability to, that I think my goal is really to try to, to chip away at that and to try to bring more people to understanding why this is important, the more subtle forms of discrimination that allowing harassment to continue can create for women in whatever profession they're in. Um, so it's a, it's a good question and a, and a tough challenge, but I think there is a lot of opportunity, but people need to, I think both having the right, um, more conversations, more education around it, but also I think it's really important to have the right messenger, which is also why I think men are so important here. I think that people are gonna hear something differently. Like a guy who pulls somebody aside after something happens and talks to them one-on-one, -on -one, that has such a different effect than like an HR manager sitting down and reprimanding them, you know? And so I think that that's sort of how you get there and a lot of what we're, we're trying to do by bringing different 
groups together and identifying people who can be leaders in different communities. No, I mean, I think that's right. I think we are in a, a moment. <laughs> and uh, I mean, these moments only arise when uh, there is a conflict. And I think it's just something that we all have to commit to working through. Uh, 